Good morning. We welcome you to Circle of Christian Church this morning. How about the weather we've been having, huh? It's going to be another beautiful day out there today. If you didn't have time to mow your yard yesterday, you probably should take advantage of it today. You might notice we're a little bit thinned out behind us here. Um, we want to bring those up to you now. Play more of an acoustic set today. Uh, Travis and is, not, is not with us this morning. Um, we sent out something on the prayer chain this past week. His wife, Hannah, um, was in the hospital for a couple days. Thankfully, she's home now. I think I see her on right now. So, Hannah, we're glad you're doing good. Um, we continue to pray for you. Uh, and everybody give Travis a round of applause. Four, four kids at home. Uh, and everybody that's helped out. So, we're glad that Hannah's doing better. Uh, and then Lori Mellenbrook's not with us this morning. She went up to the Mayo Clinic uh, with her son, uh, Pat, and uh, still looking for answers. So those are continued prayers that we've got uh, some, some of, from our, um, uh, our members on this uh, praise team. And then also uh, Ronnie Parrott is going to be having a procedure uh, as well. So we want to keep him in, in, in prayer this week as well. well. We hope you join us this morning right now as we begin our song worship here this morning. Reminding ourselves that we're here on this earth for one purpose. We're here for God. God, we are here for you.
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrows come to steal the joy I hold When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, and shame no longer has a place to hide. And I am not a captive to the light. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I won't be shaken. Oh, I won't be shaken. Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your In Psalms 136, reading out of the NASB, it says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who alone does great wonders, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the heavens with skill, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his loving kindness is everlasting. To him who made the great lights, you guessed it, 
for his loving kindness is everlasting. You are good. You are good. As we prepare for communion coming up here in just a minute, I encourage you during this next song to go ahead and go get your prepackaged communion that you have at home. Again, if you don't have it, don't forget to come through the church drive throughout the week. It's in a brown box outside. But if you don't have it, just go get yourself something, a piece of bread, a cracker, some juice. Prepare your heart, prepare your mind to take communion with us here in just a little bit. from Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 3. I'm going to hold this mic just right. God says, if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and belongs to another man, will he still return to her? Will not that land be completely polluted? But you are a harlot with many lovers, yet you turn to me, declares the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the bare heights and see. Where have you not been violated? By the roads you have sat for them. Like an Arab in the desert. And you have polluted the land with your harlotry and your wickedness. Therefore the showers have been withheld. There has been no spring rain. Yet you had a harlot's forehead. You refused to be ashamed. Have you not just now called to me? My father, 
you are the friend of my youth. Will he be angry forever? Will he be indignant to the end? Behold, you have spoken and have done evil things, and you have had your way. Then the Lord said to me in the days of Josiah the king, have you, sent, have you seen what faithless Israel has done? She went up on every high hill under every green tree, and she was a harlot there. I thought after she had done these things, she will return to me, but she did not return. And her treacherous sister Judah saw it all. And I saw that for all the adulteries of faithless Israel, I had sent her away and given her a writ of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she went and was a harlot also. Because of the lightness of her harlotry, she polluted the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. Yet in spite of all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with all her heart, but rather in deception, declares the Lord. In Jeremiah, what we just read is uh, uh, Judah and Israel breaking their covenant with the Lord. And the Lord uses marital language to describe that. Let's, let's read um, the introduction of marriage in Genesis chapter 2. Verse 22. The Lord God fashioned into a woman with the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my ch flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. The two shall become one flesh. God is using that description to violate, uh, violating the covenant to illustrate um, what Israel and Judah had done. That raises many questions, but two things are clear. Marriage is a central issue in our Bible, and there are many parallels in Scripture between our covenant to our spouse and our covenant to God. Let's read a few here. Proverbs 19, chapter 19, verse 14, house and wealth are inherited, but a prudent wife is a gift from God. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 through 16, and the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it from, with favor from your hand. But you say, why does he not? Because the Lord was witness between you and your wife, between you and the wife of your youth, to whom you have been faithless, even though she is your companion and wife by covenant. Did he not make them one flesh with a portion of spirit? And what was God seeking? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. I think the key part of this scripture right here is the man's upset because God no longer accepts his offering on the Lord's altar because God has seen him be unfaithful to his wife by covenant. Proverbs 31.10, an excellent wife who can find she is far more precious than jewels. Isaiah 54, verse 5. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your Redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. And Isaiah 62, 5. Very similar. Like a young man taking a virgin as his bride, he who formed you will marry you. As a groom is delighted with his bride, so your God will delight in you. Let, let's summarize. In the first reading in Jeremiah, Israel and Judah has broken their covenant with the Lord, and the Lord uses marital language to describe that. Scripture starts off, God says. 
In Malachi, a man has uh, broken his covenant with his wife, and the Lord will not accept his offering because he's seen his adultery. In Proverbs, we are told that a prudent wife is a gift from God. It is not by chance. And she is more precious than jewels because it's your spirit that makes you happy, not something you can buy or possess. Isaiah says, your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. Finally, uh, the Apostle John in Revelations 19.9 writes, then the, agent, then the angel said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. Are you serving your relationship with your spouse? What about your relationship with God? It takes daily devotion to put these two above yourself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to the table this morning and we ask you for the strength and the faith to give up our planning for ourselves, to devote ourselves to you and to our spouses and our families and leave our planning, what will happen to us, to you and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
this love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't turn it, I don't deserve it, till you give yourself away. Oh, the As we go to our, our prayer time this morning, I want to remind you if you have a prayer praise or a concern that you would like to, for our church to put on the prayer list and, and be added this week as we send that prayer list out, go ahead and put it on the comment section on your Facebook Live thing. And as we go into this time of prayer, I wanted to read you a passage of scripture that Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, and it's words of encouragement for us. In chapter 5, verse 16 of 1 Thessalonians, he says, Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And I know with the circumstances that surround us right now, sometimes it's difficult for us to be joyful. Sometimes it's difficult for us to give thanks in all circumstances, for the word all is an absolute. And, and God wants us to be able to do that. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is our will that God wants for each one of us. And we do that through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us go to, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray with me. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, now as we come to you and we lay our concerns and our praises at your feet. We just pray, Lord, that you will be with each one of us. And we're so thankful, Lord, as we come to you this morning for all the things that you have given to us. All the things you, that, that have, you have given to us in times uh, that sometimes it looks kind of bleak. And we're, we're so thankful, Lord. And above all, we're so thankful for that love that you have for each one of us. We just pray, Lord, this morning for those that are ill those that are preparing for surgery. We just pray, Lord, you'll be with them. Be with the doctors and the nurses that will be administering to them. And we just pray that you'll be with their families as well. Give them the comfort that only you can provide. We just pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with the loss of loved ones at this time. We just pray, once again, you'll be with those families as well. We pray, Lord, for those that are struggling with emotional distress, with this situation in their lives, whether it be a financial stress, whether it's worried about a job situation, whether they're concerned about children or parents or purely the stress of being isolated from support groups. We just pray for that, and we pray for this situation. We pray, Heavenly Father, for our church family, that we will continue to be Christians whether we're inside this building or not on Sunday morning. And I just pray, Lord, you'll continue to be with us, and we're, we just pray for the unity that we can have one, one for the other as we continue to seek your glory and as continue to, to be the type of church that you want us to be, that type of church that fulfills that great commission. And we just pray, Heavenly Father, that you'll continue to be with our men and women of the armed forces. As they, are, as they are supporting our country throughout the entire world, providing us with the freedoms that we certainly enjoy. We pray, Lord, for the health care healthcare workers. They're the real heroes right now, Lord. They go to work every day, and they battle this pandemic every day. And I just pray, Lord, you'll continue to be with them and their families as well. And I just pray, Lord, once again, you'll be with Dr. Allen this morning as he gives us the message that you'll fill his heart 
with the Spirit of God that he can deliver the message that you want us to hear today. We just love you, Lord, and we just praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. First things first. Happy birthday, Grandma Andra. Today we're celebrating the first day of the official end of our stay-at-home order, which is implemented to protect us from the spread of COVID virus. Our lives have been turned upside down by the stay-at-home order, social distancing, mask wearing, and wearing PPE. PPE. What is that? This is PPE. PPE. What does that stand for? It's personal protective equipment. And it's the cornerstone of what stands between healthcare providers and the COVID-19 virus. It's the life protecting piece of equipment that you hear about being in short supply. And I can attest to the accuracy of these stories. We've been blessed by many friends who've sewn gowns and masks and provided them to the hospitals and clinics. If you'd have seen me walking into a clinic exam room just like this a couple months ago, you would have been quite alarmed, and, but now it's commonplace. Babies don't even cry anymore when I come into the room with a mask on. I'm highly appreciative of PPE, but it's burdensome and it gets in the way. It knocks your microphone off when you're trying to talk. Your foot goggles fog up and your face shield falls off and it's hot. So. It's time to take off our PPE and live together again. Since Easter, our congregation has been blessed by a series of messages from Harold Nusser, Bill Dyer, and Ryan Hayden. On Easter Sunday, Harold shared from the book of Mark about Jesus' appearance to the uh, disciples after the resurrection and their initial unbelief concerning the truth of that resurrection. At the end, Mark exhorted the disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Bill Dyer then gave us a message of encouragement to be participants and not spectators in sharing the gospel. He shared with us the wonderful story of Harold Nusser's life and ministry and how he is a model of how anyone can be a participant in sharing the gospel at any point in our lives. Two weeks ago, Ryan Hayden reiterated the message of bringing belief out of unbelief in the story of Jesus helping Thomas realize the reality of the resurrection. Last week, Ryan again challenges us to be participants and not spectators in Jesus' command to be witnesses for him to the ends of the earth. I guess by now you're wondering. I tuned in since the start of these video broadcasts and have seen such inspiring messages, and now this fool's up here talking about PPE and COVID virus. What's all this got to do with the gospel? And my answer to you would be this. We are better when we live together in community, encouraging each other, helping others build confidence, and find the hope that we have found in our faith in Jesus Christ. I think that many of us use our own forms of emotional and social PPE to protect ourselves from becoming vulnerable with one another. We allow these barriers to be built in as personal protections to excuse us for being one of the 90% of Christians that Ryan talked about last week who have never taken the opportunity to share Christ and our own story with someone else. In Hebrews 12, one through three we read, 
Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set out before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Considered him who, who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The cloud of witnesses that he's talking about here are specifically the faith heroes from the Faith Hall of Fame in chapter 11 of Hebrews. But they also include those same witnesses that Jesus called for the disciples to be in the 16th chapter of Mark in Acts chapter 1. The same witnesses that he calls you and I to be today. PPE is designed to separate the wearer from potential harm. The same can be said of the emotional and social layers of protection that we use to keep ourselves from the hurt and pain inflicted by other people, sometimes even our friends and our family members. These protections are not necessarily bad and have been built up, uh, built up to protect us from the hurts that we have experienced in the past. Abusive relationships, fear of failure, fear of being ridiculed, but they're burdensome and they get in the way of real relationship relationship that allows us to live life together, relationship that allows us to share our lives and struggles together, relationship that allows us to share our story, relationship that allows us to share Jesus. So what hinders your relationship with God and with other people? Is it fear? I want to be accepted by the group and not be excluded because people think I'm a Jesus freak. I don't want people to know how truly little I know about the Bible and about Jesus. I don't want to share with other people because I don't want them to know how messed up I am. Is it pride? I don't want to look like a fool, so I'm not going to open up with others and talk about my struggles and my pain. Is it anger? Jesus let something happen bad to me in my life, and now I can't trust him. Is it arrogance? I don't need anyone. Or is it selfishness? My time's too valuable to waste trying to put up with other people's problems. I've got enough of my own to deal with. Living for Jesus is hard. The Apostle Paul knew all about this and wrote words of encouragement to us so that we might persevere in our own faith journey. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10, we read, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Or do you feel separated from God because of sin in your life? Many days I feel like I'm such a terrible sinner that Jesus couldn't possibly love me or forgive me because I've done so many terrible things in my life. Again, Paul talks us, gives us words of encouragement. In 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16 we read, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. God knows our struggles, our hurts, our sins, and has provided coverage through them, through his son, Jesus. He also provides people people for us to have relationship with and to grow with. Those people are you and me. God did not intend for us to live life in isolation. In fact, I believe isolation is one of Satan's favorite tools. God meant for us to live in community, to share life and encourage one another. So how do we do this Christian life together? We have to first take off our emotional PPE that we've been using to protect ourselves and get real with somebody. Some of the questions we have to ask ourselves are, what is my PPE? What am I using to hide from being open in relationships? How does it separate me from danger? How does it separate me from relationships with others? What am I afraid of? Who has hurt me? How was I hurt? How does it separate me from relationship with God? And who has God put in my life that I feel safe with? Who can I trust? Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. To come together in relationship, 
we have to be prepared to help those around us peel off those layers of protection, no matter how hard it may be. I'm aware that these layers of protection don't come off overnight. They've been built up over years, and in many cases for good reason. But if they're hindering and entangling you, and keeping you from living in the life that God wants you to live, you need to start working with those people whom you have trust in and start running the race that God has marked out for you. I realize that this is the hard part. These protections have been built up because we don't, like, we don't feel like anyone loves us and there's no one we can trust. Where can I find people that I can trust and be vulnerable with? Where is the community of people I can live together with in fellowship? That answer should be the church. The members of God's church, not just here in Circleville, but throughout the world, we need to help remember that the greatest commandment is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. We are all called to live in community, to live together, and to share one another's lives for a reason. It's not just so I can sit in the sanctuary or your living room on Sunday morning and hear the music that I like. It's so that we can bear one another's burdens, give encouragement, share in joys, grieve in times of sorrow and loss, and find the hope that Jesus offers together. Hebrews 3, 12 and 13 says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. God has put us together to encourage each other, to help us build confidence and find hope so that we can run our race with perseverance. One of the best memories that I have from my kids' time at Jackson Heights is my oldest son, Ross, and his experience with cross country. He's built like a football player if you don't know him, but he didn't like the sport at all. I loved football. And after two years of watching him endure football just to please me, we decided he wouldn't go off for football his freshman year. We asked him to find a sport that he would like to participate in, and he chose cross country. He finished last or close to it most of the races that first year. But the craziest thing would happen at the end of the race. His teammates who had finished, would race, who had finished the race and many spectators would come back to the place where he was on the course and encourage him on as he finished the race. By the time he was a senior, he had worked his way up to be one of the varsity runners and was going to back, was able to go back to, and encourage the other runners who were in the place where he had been just three years before. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 22 through 25 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one, and on, one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some, have been, some, have, some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The challenge of encouraging each other, the, the challenge to encourage each other, help others build confidence and find the hope that we have so we have so that they can run their race with perseverance is not just an individual challenge, but also a challenge for our church as a body. Our meeting together as a congregation has changed significantly in the past two months, but our focus and purpose have not. Our mission statement at Circleville Christian Church is to know God and to make him known. To do this, we strive to provide an environment where people can gather together, feel safe, loved, and encouraged and find their own relationship with Jesus, or to continue to grow their personal relationship with Jesus, whether that be with bodies in the sanctuary or on Facebook Live. We do not view this as a video production, but rather an effort to extend the body of Christ to those who cannot physically participate in the Sunday worship service. The intent to create this video broadcast was in the works prior to the in initiation of the stay-at-home order, but it came more rapidly to fruition after the order so that our body of believers could continue to gather together. Little did we know that the message from Circleville would be shared in places as far away as Egypt. Collectively, the elders' vision for our church to be able to grow together is this. 
to provide excellent preaching that is biblical and Christ-focused, to provide teaching that will help individuals grow where they are in their own personal walk with Jesus, including Sunday school classes, Sunday school classes, small group Bible studies, and youth groups, to offer fellowship opportunities, either live or virtual, that will help the body avoid the isolation that steals the joy of lives lived together, to encourage individuals to recognize the opportunities that they have to evangelize and spread the gospel. And it's here that I have to pause and remind myself that I'm providing a witness each time I open my mouth. It all depends on what comes out of my mouth as to what type of witness I will be. And to perform acts of service. Our aim is to grow into the body of believers described in Ephesians 4, 15 through 16, which says, instead, of, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become, the very, in every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So are you ready to take off your personal and emotional PPE and be open and authentic with others? Are you ready to live together in community? Are you ready to be available for whatever God is calling you to? Are you ready to be a participant and not a spectator? Are you ready to bring belief out of unbelief? Are you ready to be a witness for Christ and share your story? Are you ready to invest in others and trust someone else to invest in you? We are better together. I grew up by miles of redwood trees, tall, strong, and beautiful, and I learned a couple of things, that redwoods are the tallest trees in the world. They are some of the strongest, most resilient. Storms and fires cannot take them, and they are Latin for the term forever living. But their roots don't even run that deep. They are only that strong, and they only live that long because their roots intertwine with other surrounding redwood trees. Alone, a redwood won't grow as tall and can sometimes be blown over by the weather. But in a forest of redwoods, underneath the soil surface, there's millions of roots connected, and they are better together. And when I think of these redwoods, I think of us here. I think of how often we try to go through life by ourselves. The times we've been hurt, the times we've been left, the times we've been damaged by someone else. And so we decide that we are just fine, all alone. But God says, that's not what I created you for. Jesus was passionate about people and community and believed the church was the hope of the world. He calls it a family because here we find our identity. He calls it a temple because we're like pieces that come together to build and hold up one another. He calls it a flock of sheep because we're cared for by the same shepherd. He calls it a body because we're all different parts and no purpose or function is like the other. He calls it his bride because the church Church is the love of his life and he calls it a vine or a garden because we're only productive when we're connected he says the lost have hope through it he says the hurt are healed through it he says that we must love forgive and fight to protect it because the community of the church is his absolute favorite Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Much like a redwood forest, we need each other to survive. We need to hold on to one another, intertwine, stand firm against the trials of this life. The gates of hell will not have the victory when we are the church God wants us to be. So let's be redwoods. Alone, they can't do much, but together they are miraculous. Together they are brilliant. Together they hold each other up. So no storms, no hell can take them. The church, the bride, the body, the temple, the flock, the family, the garden, the forest of redwood, whatever you want to call it, God says we're better together. So no matter the weather, fight for it. We were better.
were made to grow here. We were made to stand tall here. We were made to be a part of this forest here with each other, representing the creation of God, staying strong against all odds and going through this life together. We want to thank Hosanna Poetry. For those of you who maybe don't remember, she was here a few years ago, performed that one live. We want to thank her. That's again Hosanna Poetry. You can follow her online for spoken word. We want to thank you for joining us again this Sunday morning. A beautiful day today. Get out there and see what the Lord has made. Be joyful. Be glad in it. Join us one final time as we remind you, as we remind ourselves. We scream to God, we are here for you. Thanks so much. Have a great week.